Hey there, y'all. Prophet David Taylor here. Welcome to my Facebook Live audience, and there's my Periscope audience. Uh, welcome to you guys, too. So, uh, glad to be here with you uh, this weekend and bring you the Word of the Lord once again. Bring the Word of the Lord to the body of Christ. And as you know, I always pray before I come on. I say that because I want you to know I'm not just making stuff up, and I'm not just shooting from the hip. And I also say that because I want you to know, remember I taught you, you can always test a prophetic word. You don't have to just receive a prophetic word because somebody says it's one. You can always test it. So that's why I always tell you that I pray before I speak because I want the Spirit of God to speak through me. And as you know, I say it all the time, if the Holy Ghost ain't saying nothing, I'm not saying nothing. Okay, because it's all about what God has to say. So uh, I prayed and asked the Lord what was the prophetic word he wanted me to release to the body of Christ this week. And the answer came back through the Spirit. The word is rejoice. Rejoice. So uh, I listened to the Holy Ghost about getting some scriptures about, you know, specifically what is he talking about. So we're going to look at a couple of scriptures. We're going to look at Nehemiah 8.10, a very familiar scripture. Uh, and we're going to look at how that applies to us today right now in this context. Nehemiah 8.10 says, and I'm reading out of the New American Standard Bible, Then he said to them, Go, eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Again, go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So what does that mean? That means that the joy you find in God and the joy you find in serving God is the thing that gives you strength to continue. Uh, there's this verse where Jesus says the Lord had been ministering and he'd forgotten to eat. And so Peter and his friends told the Lord, you should eat something. And the Lord responded by saying, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Because the Lord's joy, he found so much joy in serving the Father. That's why Jesus said it all the time, that he was there to do the Father's will. And the Lord found so much joy when he was a human in serving the Father that sometimes he'd forget to eat. Now you and I know, the only time you're going to forget to eat is if you're caught up in something you love. <laughs> That's the only time you're going to ignore the hunger pangs in your stomach. If you are caught up doing something that you love, then you can uh, skip your meal then. I'm going to look that scripture up for you because I want to give you that address. Uh, but the only time you're going to get caught up in something uh, that makes you forget your meal is if you're enjoying what you're doing. Uh, that scripture is in John chapter 4, verse 31 says, Meanwhile, the disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he told them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. King James, I have meat to eat that you know not of. So that was one of the Lord's secret weapons when he was a human. He got so much joy out of serving the Father that sometimes, again, he forget his meal. So... That's what God is trying to tell us today, that the joy of the Lord is our strength, that we find so much joy in serving God, that that's what gives us strength to go on. But that also means the converse is true. That means that if you have lost your joy in living, you are tired all the time. There's this basketball commercial on several years ago, and it was a bunch of old school players sitting around on a basketball court. Uh, and I think it might have been a Nike commercial, and they were talking about playing basketball, and one of the dudes said, is no one that's winning that's talking about their arm is tired. I thought that was awesome because it's so true. In the heat of a basketball game, whichever team is winning, whichever team has the momentum, whichever team is up on points and look like they're going to win, they just shoot, and they just run and shoot and run and shoot. You know why? Because they have the joy of winning. It gives you energy. Okay, so this is true on every level it can be true on. And this is another really good practical example about how sometimes people try to use these super spooky spiritual explanations to make you feel like 
the joy of God is going to church and getting filled with the Holy Ghost and falling out and rolling around on the floor and then going back to a life you're not happy with. No, <laughs> no, it's not either or, it's both and. You both can enjoy the presence of God and get in his presence and get filled with the Holy Spirit and enjoy praising him and go back to a life that makes you happy. That's the way Jesus lived. Jesus did not just spend all his time in prayer with the Father. He spent a lot of time in prayer with the Father. But then the Lord came out and, and worked and lived among the people and did what the Father called him to do. So the Lord had vertical joy, joy in his relationship with the Father, and he had horizontal or living joy, joy in living, because he was doing what he was born to do. He was doing what he loved to do. Okay? And that's what gives you the joy and the strength to move forward because I promise you, if you're not living your dream, if you're not living the life you're supposed to be living, you are tired all the time. Depressed, don't want get, to get out of bed, don't feel like there's a reason to go on because you've got no joy in living. Okay? So what specifically is different about the joy of the Lord? Well, we're going to look at some other scriptures to answer that question. So... Uh, let's look at Psalms, the book of Psalms, uh, chapter 126, verse 5. Oh, actually, I'll start at verse 4 and then read into verse 5. Verse 4 says, Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. Uh, in the King James Version, it says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Now let me uh, remind all of you Protestants watching me, let me remind all you 21st century Western American Christians that the idea of going bye-bye to some pie in the sky when you die <laughs> is not biblical. All of the promises that God gave the Jews were practical and physical right now for this life. What Jesus did when he came was he added eternity to earth. He added eternal life and he added all that, that God has in the heavenly realms for you once your spirit steps out of your body. He added that to the program. But all of the promises of God to the Hebrews were physical. They were practical and they are right now. So that whole idea that's been introduced in Christianity for generations now about uh, how it's about going to heaven, that is not true. And how it's about when we get over on the other side, that's not true. The promises of God are right now in your life right now. So think about that when I read these verses again. Psalm 126, 4 and 5. Restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. What does that mean? Well, let's look at it practically. Restore our captivity. What is captivity? Captivity is debt. Credit card debt, uh, mortgage debt, student loan debt, people that you owe, if you're in debt, you're in captivity. What is captivity? Sickness. If you are chronically sick or you have chronic illnesses, then sometimes you feel like you're a prisoner in your own body. What is captivity? Captivity is bad relationships and bad marriages. Because I promise you, if you are married to the wrong person, or you are with someone you don't really want to be with, you feel stuck. You may have gotten involved with them because you didn't want to be alone. You may have been fornicating, having sex out of wedlock, and the sex got good to you, and you didn't want to you know, give it up. You didn't want to leave that alone. But that doesn't mean they're the right person for you. But if you are with someone you ain't got no business with, I promise you, you feel stuck. I promise you that when you look in the world around you, you are casting longing eyes, wishing you were in a better situation. So when it says, restore our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south, that means they want God to turn them back into a prosperity flow. Turn me back into a freedom flow. Let me get out of debt. Let me get out of this sickness so my body can be healthy. And let me get out of this unhealthy relationship. And then it says, those who sow in tears shall reap with joyful shouting. But what does that mean? One of the 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 strangest truths about life is that if you want to do something wrong it don't take but a little bit of wrong to have explosive consequences because wrong comes 
compressed and action-packed in just a little bit. So if you want to sin, it don't take but a word or a look or a choice. All you got to do is plant one little seed of sin and it'll explode into this thing. It's amazing in a, in a tragic way <laughs> how a little bit of sin can cause you a world of trouble. For example, if you're known for being truthful and you're being honest and you've told the truth for 20 years and then you get busted in one lie, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is it's going to have a retroactive effect and now everything you say is going to be suspect <laughs> because of that one lie. So that's, that's sin, that's negativity, that's wrongdoing and unfortunately that's true. If you are trying to do something, hey, God bless you guys, baby girl. If you're trying to do something good and you're trying to do something positive, you know what you have to do? You have to do it over and 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 over again. Now, why is life like that? I do not know. <laughs> I think maybe it's because of the curse of sin. But what I do know is that if you are trying to build something good, no matter what it is, a healthy body, a healthy reputation, if you're trying to raise a healthy child, if you're trying to build a healthy marriage, if you're trying to start a business, if you're trying to start a ministry, if you're trying to start a school, if you're trying to start a charity, it doesn't matter. If you're trying to do something healthy and positive, good, you have got to do it over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And that's eventually going to bring you to tears. You're going to have some days where you're so tired of sewing into <laughs> what you're trying to do until it just makes you cry. Where, where you're just sitting up there on the side of your bed just bawling with your head in your hands, just crying. Where I can't believe. Uh, let me give you another practical example. One of the best examples I can give you is the semester before you graduate. Anything. Junior high, high school, associate's degree, tech school, college, military academy, uh, university, master's, PhD, it doesn't matter. The semester before you graduate is going to be the hardest semester you ever had in your life. You're going to have to push yourself, no matter how old you are. You can be 18, 19 years old in the prime of your life. You're going to have to push yourself. You know why? Because for us to pull off something good and positive, constructive, we got to do it over and over and over and over again. And sometimes when you get down right to the last little stretch, you got to push yourself the hardest because when you sow, you're going to sow in tears. You will, it will eventually get you to the point where you are just, you are just. Ask anyone that has a good marriage if they didn't have some really dark times, if they didn't have some times where they cried themselves to sleep. Ask someone that's waiting to get married, someone that's waiting on a spouse, if they haven't had many nights where they've cried themselves to sleep. If you've gotten in the path that God wants you to be in and you're not sleeping around, you're not fornicating, you're not committing adultery, you're not uh, you know, trying to sleep with another man's wife or another woman's husband, you're not watching pornography, you're keeping your garments and you're living holy, but you're waiting for a relationship, sometimes that's going to get really heavy and you're going to cry yourself to sleep. Because once again, when you are trying to do something positive, you've got to do it over and over and over again. So the Bible is trying to tell you that God pays attention to that tearful sowing. That God knows sometimes you've had days where you've been so tired, you've gone out to the field with your seed just weeping. Like, Lord have mercy, when am I going to get out this debt? Lord have mercy, when am I going to meet the right person? Lord have mercy, when am I going to lose this weight? Lord have mercy, when am I going to write this paper and finally turn it into my professor and finally get my degree? God pays attention to that, and the Bible is trying to encourage you by let you, letting you know you're going to come again with joyful shouting. Now, in the Hebrew, that word with joyful shouting or reaping joy, in the Hebrew, that word is renah, renah, and it means a ringing cry. God said there's going to be a ringing cry. You're going to shout, and it's going to ring out when it's time for you to reap. So, again, the word that the Holy Ghost gave me for today was rejoice. That means it's time for that ringing cry. So that means that those of you that have been sowing in tears, that have been doing good over and over and over and over again, it's time to rejoice because you're going to get your harvest. It's time for your harvest. And it also means, and I heard Bishop Jakes talk about this too, it also means you have to change your attitude. <laughs> what does that mean? 
It means you sow in tears, but you got to reap in joy. You can't reap uh, being miserable. <laughs> you have to be happy. You have to have a positive attitude. If you don't approach your harvest with a positive attitude, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss a lot of it, and you might miss it altogether. What do I mean by that, and what does that mean practically? That means if you're bitter against men, and God is about to send you your husband, and every man that talks to you, you snap at him because you've never forgiven your ex or never gotten over your past, that means God sent that man right into your life and you still so bitter and angry, you pushed him away. That means you missed your harvest. Being bitter because you didn't learn how to come back to be joyful. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say you have some type of prejudice issues and there are certain ethnic groups, certain people that you just don't like those people. What if God is going to send you a breakthrough in your career through somebody you don't like? When you meet them, if you are full of prejudice and anger and bigotry, that person might be coming to you to hand you the biggest blessing you've ever seen, and you push them back with that negative attitude because you're not joyful. That's very real. A lot of people have missed their blessings in life because they had that negative spirit when it was time to harvest. And you can, the Bible tells you there, you got to reap with joyful shouting, with a ringing cry. You got to be on the positive tip to reap the harvest God wants you to have. So that's why sometimes when you feel the Spirit of God telling you to forgive, sometimes you don't want to forgive. And when you feel the Spirit of God telling you sometimes to forgive yourself and move on, sometimes you don't want to do that. But what the Lord is trying to show you is that you've got to come back to a joyful, positive spirit so you can reap the fullness of what it is God is trying to send you. Because why in the world would you go through all that and then get to harvest season and then miss? That doesn't even make any sense. And how much longer are you going to have to go round and round before you come back to that again? Mm -mm. So let's just forgive and forget and move on and forgive ourselves and forget other people. Let's ask God to purge us of our prejudice, our bigotry, our bitterness, um, Another practical example is if you've never forgiven your parents. Lord have mercy, that's huge. When you are a child, you hold every sin your parents committed against you in your heart. Because when you're a child, you think your parents are supposed to do you perfectly. You think they have to make every decision right, they have to say everything right, they have to live right in front of you, they have to do everything right. And anything your parents don't do right, you condemn them instantly, you hold it against them. And you're wagging your finger, uh-huh, mama's a hypocrite. She's telling me what I don't do, and she look at her. That's what it's like when you're a child. When you grow up, God calls you out of that. God calls you to realize that your parents were sinners. They're not perfect people. They have feet of clay, and you need to forgive them and honor them anyway. Do you know what happens if you don't do that? If you don't do that, I stop by to tell you, you're going to turn into them. Yes, you will. Yes, you, for those of you that are listening to me and you can't see me, I'm shaking my head. <laughs> yes, you will. Yes, you will. You sit up there and you talk about mom and daddy for years and years and years and how they did this and they did that and they were no good and this wasn't right and they should have did this and blah, 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 blah. You're going to turn into them. Wait till you have your kids. You're going to find the very thing that you condemned your parents for coming out your mouth. That's why you have to forgive. So that's another practical example of how when God is calling you to forgiveness and to let some stuff go is because he's trying to move you into joy so that when you have your kids, you are not parenting in a bitter spirit. You can't raise your kids based on what you wish you had gotten. You can't raise your kids based, based on a completely reactionary posture to your parents. You've got to love your kids for who they are and what they need. So that may mean there's a lot of stuff from your childhood you need to get over. But that is how you reap your harvest in joy. All right, let's look at one more scripture. Galatians 6, 9. Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. In the King James Version, you're probably more familiar with that one. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So that's what I mean when I say the word of the Lord this week was rejoice. The Holy Spirit is telling us we're coming into that harvest. And so we need to put on our rejoicing hat. 
You need to put on your rejoicing mentality. You need to put on your rejoicing attitude so that you can get the fullness. And another word of encouragement, and then I'm going to give a prophetic word and we're going to pray and close out. Another word of encouragement that's very, very important is that you have to understand that whatever it is that you're doing that God gave you to do, it's for a reason and it has a greater purpose. And sometimes we can get really uh, discouraged in that. Sometimes we can really feel like it's not really making a difference. Sometimes we can really ask ourselves, why am I out here? Because many times when God starts you out, God starts you out really, really small, just like a tiny seed. And sometimes when you envision it, you envisioned it like Joseph. You saw this big thing in your mind. But you're never going to start out with the big thing. If you start on the path that God puts you on, you're going to start really, really small and really, really obscure. Many times really on the backside of the desert and don't nobody know who you are and a whole bunch of things. And it can get really challenging when you're still at that stage. Because a lot of people in ministry, you know, they want to be a a big name and they want to have a big ministry and they want to be on TV and blah, 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 blah. Because we've been in the age of the celebrity preacher for a while. So when I was a kid, people didn't think that way. People did not go into ministry because they were thinking about trying to get on TV and have a mega church and all, all that stuff happened in the 90s. So now many times when people think about ministry, they think about big names, big ministries, big churches, all these different kind of things. And serving God is not about that. If you get to that level in your service to God, that's going to be a byproduct, a byproduct of your service to God. But God is about doing what he wants you to do. And God is about speaking the truth of his word. And God is about loving people. And if you love one person with the love of Christ, you have done your job. If you save one soul with the truth of God's salvation, you have done your job. So it's not about necessarily about crowds or platforms or things like that. The Lord ministered to crowds and the Lord ministered in a big platform, but the Lord also ministered one-on-one. -on -one. So you can't have that kind of mindset when you go into ministry that somehow you're not successful or impactful if you don't have this big kind of, because that's not true. But sometimes, oh, how we think it's true. And if you think that's true, then it's very easy to get discouraged and feel like your life isn't making a difference because you're not a big name minister and that is not true. If you can change one person's life through the power of the Holy Spirit, if God gives you a word or a teaching or a song, a word of encouragement, or sometimes just a smile, and you share that, you can give somebody spiritual food that they'll be feeding off of for years, I kid you not. You can just speak a word in the power of the Holy Ghost, and they can eat off that word for decades. See? You've done your job. You've let God use your life. You've let God speak through you to bring life to others. You're successful. And if you ever do get on that, you know, big name level, there's nothing wrong with that. It's going to be a byproduct. It's not the point. And uh, that's why a lot of people get disillusioned with church. Because once you get into many thousands of members, there's no way the pastor or the leader or the prophet or the apostle or the main person that you came there to see there's no way they can spend time with you personally with all those people. That's not physically or humanly possible. And a lot of people get really disappointed. <laughs> and a lot of people get really angry and offended because they really believe that you can go to like, you know, a 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 member megachurch and get personal attention from the pastor. That's almost never going to happen. So if you're going to a big name church with the idea that somehow past the pastor, the apostle, the prophet, the main person is going to pay special attention to you. If it doesn't happen and you get, you know, an associate minister or a junior pastor or whatever, then you get all mad. Moses had that same problem. You can't minister to all those people one-on-one -on -one once you get up into numbers like that. So that's what I'm trying to tell you, those of you that are in ministry or going into ministry. I'm trying to encourage you to help you understand it's not about numbers. It's about letting God use your life in whatever way he's called you to do that. Whatever God has called you to do. Uh-oh, looks like Periscope dropped up. I don't know what happened. Whatever God has called you to do, it's about letting him use your life in that way. It's not about numbers. Oh, I guess my phone is ringing. <laughs> I'm going to have to uh, call my son back. So, um... 
Uh oh, looks like I lost. <coughs> Excuse me, looks like I lost my periscope, people. Hold on, let me pull them back up. <coughs> I'm sorry. Man, okay, there we go. I dropped the connection and didn't want to come back. Okay, so anyway, so so the point I'm making there is that uh, once again, that it's not about numbers. It's not about uh, having a big name. It's not about hey, Periscope audience. Uh, I'm sorry, I guess we dropped before. It's not about any of those things. It's about letting God use your life. And so I just want you to be encouraged that if you're not on the level maybe you envision yourself being on, that level is going to be a byproduct of your service to God. So the word for today was rejoice. God wants us to rejoice. God wants us to have joy in living. And the only way you're going to have joy in living is not just the joy of going to church and being filled with the Holy Ghost. It's also the joy of living your dream of living the will of God uh, in your life every day. Okay? So there's a prophetic word that the Lord wants me to share. I'll share that prophetic word. Uh, for behold, my people, it is your time, it is your season for harvest. Those of you that have been struggling, those of you that have been sowing, those of you that have been reaching out, those of you, ha you that have been crying out, I have heard your every word, I have kept you every tear, I have heard you every cry. Now I command you to rejoice. I command you to move in happiness. I command you to prepare to receive your harvest for it's time to rejoice and receive everything that you've been working towards. Don't be afraid. Don't be angry. Don't be bitter. But know that there is a reward right now in this time for all the work that you have done. I see you. I know you. I love you. And I have blessed you says the spirit of the living God. Amen and amen. So, so that's it uh, for this week. Uh, our word was rejoice. I just praise God for that word. And uh, so glad to be able to come to you and share the word of the Lord with you. So we're going to close out in prayer. By the name of Jesus, we just come to you thanking you for your prophetic word, thanking you for receiving uh, the word of rejoicing, thanking you that you see our every effort you know our every thought, our every tear, our every choice. And thank you, O oh God, that it's time to rejoice so we, we can receive all that we've been working for in seeking your face and seeking your will and doing what you've called us to do. And we thank you for it and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. All right, y'all. That's it for this week. Um, next week, next Sunday, I'm going to be at a convention. So I'll probably come on at 2.30 and then tell you, I'll either record the prophetic word early so it'll be there for you, or I'll come on later in the day. But I am going to be at a convention uh, next Sunday. So uh, just check my channel, uh, check my Periscope, check my Facebook Live uh, to see. Uh, I'll try to get up early Sunday morning and release the word so it'll be there for you so you can hear it. And uh, then maybe I'll just come on at 2.30 and tell you where I am, how's it, how everything's going. All right, thank you so much for tuning in. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.